What does it mean to govern responsibly in a world where trust and accountability are increasingly elusive? Tonight we delve into the heart of democracy, into the fabric that binds the governed and the governing. Partisan politics often drowns out the voices of the very people it seeks to represent. However, there's an organization that exists as a beacon of hope geared toward fostering a brighter, more inclusive and engaged future for all. We're honored to host executive members from the Organization for Responsible Governance tonight. This nonpartisan, nonprofit organization promotes the principles of good governance while actively engaging government, citizens, the private sector, and civil society. Founded on sound governing principles, Org Bahamas is a pivotal force in fostering dialogue, understanding, an action among government, the private sector, civil society, and most importantly, its citizens. Tonight, we dig in with key figures from ORG. Please welcome Matt Aubrey and Stefan Evans, the Executive Director and Assistant Executive Director of ORG. Gentlemen, welcome to On the Record. Good to have you with us. Matt, welcome Stephane. back. Thank you for having us back. It's Stephane, welcome wonderful. for the first time. First time. Thank All you right. So, much for so <laughs> <laughs> I feel like uh, people are familiar with the group. Uh, and what you do, and I think for those of us in the media and in this business, we're always talking about you, referencing you, uh, bugging you from time to time. From <laughs> Never bugging. <you. laughs> <laughs> but let's uh, first of all begin with a brief overview of what it is that your organization. So I think it's it's critical that we do get a chance to kind of reintroduce org at this time. I think it's I think we've done a lot. We were founded in 2015, so it's now been eight years uh, since our founding, and a lot has happened. Um, the organization Responsible Governance, which is principally a not-for-profit organization here in the Bahamas, and our mission is really to kind of foster the principles of good governance, transparency, accountability, uh, participatory uh, governance, uh, following rule of law, these things that make great sense, equity and inclusion. But we do that by engaging citizens and the private sector in activities of education, uh, community involvement. And in doing that, what we know is that if you do that, what you foster is greater, more inclusive social and economic development. So what we do that, the way we do that is really in four principal areas. We started originally as an organization looking to try and advance policy initiatives. And so you would have seen a lot of involvement in freedom of information passage and uh, procurement laws and fiscal responsibility, things that gave uh, the laws that were intended to give the citizens opportunity to understand the way that government was making decisions, the way that government was spending money. But we realized that you can pass those laws and they could be wonderful, high-level laws meeting a global standard, but if there's not an active citizenry watching, paying attention, calling for their, their, their application, then much, very little can sometimes happen. And we've seen that with things like freedom of information, which I know we'll talk about. So in addition to the policy development, we spent a lot of time on citizen engagement, going into communities, helping people to understand their role, the systems of governance, and then how they can utilize their voice and their agency to make a difference, sometimes just in their own community, much less in, in the country. And that's a lot of what Stefan and his team works on. Um, we create uh, also bridges, uh, free accessible bridges for two-way communication between citizens and the government whether it be online tools that we've, we've fostered or forums that bring folks together to talk and discuss scenarios. 
And then we also focus a lot on civil society capacity because we believe that as citizens become and private sector become more interested and involved, they also need to have other like-minded, professionally and sustainably developed groups to, to, work on, uh, to work with. So we do a lot of work in that process to hopefully create a little bit of a continuity and a pathway for folks to get involved and push for more positive reforms. Um, Stefan, I have to ask you, you know, you, I talked about the fact that what you do involves a lot of reaching the community and getting people involved. Are we interested in being involved? Because I always think that sometimes we're just so apathetic to the things that are <laughs> happening around us that I, you know, I'm always curious as to what is our level of interest and even involvement. So we have found that people are definitely interested in governance. When we talk about governance, I think it's interesting. Sometimes folks mistake our name for Organization for Responsible Government. And that's a little <laughs> indicative of where we think the process is happening, mm -hmm. where it's exclusive to. But the reality is any good evidence-based approach to governance reform will look at the role that citizens play. Now, we have a robust community engagement program that over the past several years has reached a few thousand Bahamians across 10 islands, and we have a commitment to making sure that marginalized voices, and in particular voices of those on the family islands, are factored in. So we do a lot of, of that engagement. And while we have found that people may not be participating as much as they need to, it's not necessarily because they're not interested or they don't care. The reality is folks don't feel empowered. So they feel, well, we could get excited or, or hyped up about uh, the difference that we can make in our community and in, in the country at large, but what's going to happen? If I attend that community meeting, if I uh, go to that cleanup in my community, if I send a letter to my MP, will that actually make a is difference? Is anything really going right. to change? So people are quite easily able to do a lot of things that we sometimes assume they're not able to. They know about freedom of information and a lot right. of the laws that are being debated. They know about the, the relevant developments that are needed. They have lots of energy and ideas, but when they put those forward historically, it's not because they, that we don't want to listen to their voices, but we haven't created the mechanisms by which uh, it's, it's systematic, the systematic incorporation of, of the voices of the people into the process of governance. If a new bill is being debated and it impacts me, what do I do? I don't know. Do I go to the House of Assembly? Do I go to some website somewhere? So if it's unclear, particularly in a, a nation where a lot of people aren't doing so well, mm -hmm. I'm going to divert my focus back to feeding my family and paying my bills. And so... The question is, what do I do if, 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 the, if the legislation is before Parliament and as you say, we understand what it is, you know, and I tell people, payments watch a lot of news. I'm mm -hmm. in the news business, so I know they yeah. consume what we're doing right? because we see it all, all day long. But what do I do when I, you know, when I agree, I don't agree, mm -hmm. I want something to be, you know, bought to the fore I'm, or listen, it's simple dollars and cents. I'm struggling right. to survive. Right. What do I do? So I think what we understand are a few key things. One is that democracy requires accountability. And accountability is not just checks and measures, but it's a living process, one that is best achieved by virtue of citizens looking and paying attention. And be, what we saw, our, our tagline is, we want people to get informed and get involved. And that, that simply uh, speaks about what type of involvement. We all listen to on the record, every day we have a thought about it, and what do we do? We go to social media, and we tweet, we go to our mm -hmm. WhatsApp groups, and we, we sit, sound we, off. Right. we, no, we, we sound go, off. We go to yeah. the dinner table, and we talk yeah. about our frustration, or what the ideas mm -hmm. or solutions are. We're not using the most, probably, uh, appropriate avenue, which is really speaking to those folks that you would have elected. And so creating pathways where government is listening to citizens and citizens are comfortable and feel safe to be able to bring those ideas forward is crucial. When government makes policies, they need to understand from the perspective of those that are going to be most affected. And those tend to be those marginalized communities that haven't necessarily been part of the process. So what we do is we, crank, we try and create spaces 
Um, whether it be virtual spaces, we have a policy review center that is online that's free and accessible that whenever we get a piece of legislation, we're able to put it online as soon as we get it and create an opportunity. There's actually a space where you can put your ideas, your thoughts, your criticisms, and we would share that directly as you said it, unless it's profane, <laughs> with, the, with, the, with the government, the opposition for their level of consideration. Do they pay attention to what you send them? Well, that's, it's, it's one of those in progress efforts right now. We, We've created it and we realize that part of what we need to do in order to facilitate that is to prepare citizens to feel that their ideas can matter, that there is an avenue forward. So as we I do like this- I said in progress. It, yeah, it's, and because it's- A polite way of saying not really. <laughs> <laughs> well, ultimately, again, when you see, for an exa example, when freedom of information was in the process of being uh, debated and, uh, and passed, there was a, a pretty robust consultation. Sure. And I'm Based on what it was, too, as right. well. I think, you know, the freedom of information took on a life of its own, but I don't want to get too far of right. ourselves because we're going to But the mechanism of, 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 then we encourage folks to write emails. Okay. And maybe 80 people wrote emails. 80 people wrote emails such that it then caused a whole bit of discussion in Parliament while they were debating the bill because it hadn't been easily, hadn't been usually done. So we're, we're not taking advantage of a very a very potentially powerful mechanism of direct communication to the person that you would have elected to represent your constituency. That mechanism is what Westminster system is built on. And so we have to get people to understand what, how the system works, but also facilitate them utilizing the system. And then on the other side, making sure that government is available to hear that information so as they make their decisions or as they you know, decide about spending, they need to know, one, here's what the citizens' interests really are. Or if we make this decision, we need to be conscious that others can look at this and they're going to make a determination. So I want to know, though, how do we get those marginalized individuals? You mentioned, you know, the margin because, you know, you say 80 people who send emails. I can think of 10 of my friends who would be in that right. 80 yeah. who <laughs> are attuned yeah. to everything. They don't have nothing to do right. or, you know, yeah. they, they are very much so engaged. Mm -hmm. right. But. When you are talking about folks who live in these over-the-hill communities who may not have access, they ain't going online to read nothing. Let's, let's be honest. Right. The, the most, the, probably the only place you're going to catch them, you know, outside of physically going is social media, maybe. Mm -hmm. But how are you engaging or how are you getting the, the responses of these marginalized communities? Because they are the ones that concern me the most. Right. These yeah. are the people who are at really the bottom of the barrel they and that's where all of the settlements i'll say right. settle right well, how are we hearing from them well, how so, are they engaged so the reality is there isn't a set standard and that's the first part of the, the challenge that we're seeking to to help overcome and you as of right now you just have to go to them and, and physically meet them where they are mm -hmm. now i will say the reason why in in our space we work with the four sectors, so the public, private, civil society, and then we, we sort of group the citizens as a sector because our function as an individual and our family and our neighborhood is a little bit different than what we do in the day-to-day. -day. Uh, but in harnessing the power of civil society organizations, the churches, the, the civic and social groups that exist, from org's perspective, that's how we've been able to make sure that those voices are captured. But it's the underlying why that sort of provides a bit of insight on, on how we can take this to a national level. The why is because those are the spaces where people trust one another. Right. They trust their leaders. And we've been doing a lot of work in the space of public trust, not only in government, but once again, across sectors. And as is the global trend, uh, levels of public trust are low in the Bahamas. Very low. So yeah. if I don't trust that my feedback is going to be valued, that my input will be safe, that I won't be victimized because of politics, mm -hmm. I'm not going to participate, I'm not coming out, I'm not going to do anything, even if I might have a very valuable solution or idea to put forward. So through civil society, what we have found is we've been able to connect with people primarily through focus groups, uh, community forums, and um, surveys that can also be used online and on social media to make sure that those voices are captured. I will say whenever we do put out surveys and, and other public consultation tools, the primary uptick in the beginning are folks who are doing well, folks who are doing mm -hmm. okay for themselves. Mm -hmm. Th those are, are typically the demographics that respond first. Um, but when you get people into a space where they feel as though they can trust you, 
um, that there is no motive. Um, when we break some of the political walls down, because we're a nonpartisan organization, so we're doing this for the betterment of the Bahamas, um, then we're able to, to bring in those perspectives. Now, a five member team <laughs> of a small nonprofit that's primarily run out of Nassau that has to raise money to get from island to island. I because understand. we, we utilize this approach across the islands of the Bahamas. It's not going to be sustainable to think that we can come up with all of the solutions and implement them ourselves. So what we're trying to do is model what that looks like. What does it look like when you create a system that allows you to connect with local civil society organizations, with their constituents, or even political organizations right. and their constituents mm -hmm. on the ground across the islands? Because the support base is countrywide, and you capitalize on those trusted spaces so that, so that you could get to the truth. Because the other thing is you don't want to host a community forum and people don't speak at all or just saying what they think you want to hear because there's not or that they come level in, of Or they come in with agendas <laughs> right, right. As, to, to support their own and, right. and that's the, I mean, that. the, the short answer to that question, though, is to be intentional. Right. Okay. Um, so, so the construct of these engagement programs really follows a pathway where we make a point to educate, but then we make a point to listen. Yes. And that listen is so crucial. And then move towards action. And, and our role... Uh, which is sometimes important to distinguish, people assume that org is a watchdog organization and people come up all the time to us in grocery stores and at the pharmacy, thanks for holding the government's feet to the fire. And the truth is, we, we are not organized that way. We're not even, we have five people. We couldn't even do that mm -hmm, job. Mm -hmm. But if citizens are empowered and they're educated and they're involved and they're aware, then they become the most important potential watchdog or supplier of suggestions or complementers of what government is doing. That's what the end goal really is. All right, well, you talked about listening. So I have to listen to my producer who says it's time for a break. <laughs> when we come back, we're going to peek into Org's recent endeavors. We'll be back with more on the record right after this short break. And welcome back, Matt, Stefan. Let's get right back into it. Um, one of the one of the principles in, or one of the more powerful tools, I think, in in engaging people is ensuring that there's a level of education mm -hmm. that people understand what's happening in country, but also are able to decipher and able to reason. Um, and come to, to conclusions. Do you find that a challenge sometimes in, in, in trying to get uh, people to participate where people just don't understand what's happening? They know it. Mm -hmm. They know that something's happening, but do they always understand the implications or, you know, uh, or, or what pieces of legislation, action or inaction, right. do they really understand what that means? We, we, we've struggled with that in a number of instances, and what we try and do as we can is create spaces to break down fundamentally what are, first, the systems of governance. You know, do you mm -hmm. understand the three pillars of government? Do you understand how the roles? What's the role of an MP? What's the role of, of the debates in parliament? What's supposed to happen with Because you know a lot of people think the MP is just there to give them things. Right. Like, well, <laughs> we, we, can, we can go on for a whole other yeah, show on that, but the, show. the MP okay, role yeah. is, is yeah. widely expanded. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, but we, also, we also then do so with policies as they come forward. Um, based on limits of our own team, we don't always have the chance to break that down. But we've created some models that we're looking to roll out in, this, in, the, in the short term that help folks to understand key parts of legislation. Most legislation is written in a legalese that's not easy to understand. There are Even sections, right, there are sections that are about the objects and reasons which kind of describe that a little bit more, mm -hmm. but you would have had to go through the whole bill to get that and that, that's not always an effective way. So trying for us to do that, we create spaces on social media to do more explainer videos. We have taken the opportunity at different times on pieces of legislation to not only come on media, but have our own digital spaces where we do a little bit more of exploration so folks would understand the nuances of why procurement or freedom of information or an ombudsman, if anybody could even know how to pronounce that, is, is an important piece of legislation and why it would matter here. 
Um, we always try and lead, though, very honestly, with what are the opportunities of that. You know, when we, when we, we're trying to look at the fact that when we see the same things opening up in the, in the news headline year after year, some of which we've forgotten have happened in past, then we clearly need to develop some more sustainable solutions. And the opportunities for these legislation, uh, policy reforms, or, or even better understanding the system are really positive. There's a lot of opportunity that we know can tap into the inherent talent and expertise that, that resides here in the Bahamas. And that expertise isn't based on degrees. It's based on people living in our communities understanding this is how things are. These are where the real problems are. And matter of fact, here's what the solutions are. We had a, a very uh, powerful recent focus group that was a group of young folks, and they were pretty representative. There were folks that had gone to school, not gone to school, from different islands, uh, folk with, folks with disabilities, of, of different gender roles, all kinds of different perspectives. And when we sat back and listened to them, they had all the answers. <laughs> they knew I, what the I needs say it, were. I they say knew it all that. The time. Yep. I, I think so many times the solutions are lost on the so-called experts, right. right? Because it is the people who are living it day to day, right. uh, especially that a newer generation that really has the solutions, but they aren't ever heard. Right. And, and creating spaces is, is what I think we're also really about. In, in finding ways for people to feel like they've been heard, mm -hmm. it starts to build their comfort and capacity that they can be heard in other spaces as well. Um, so, so we see, uh, we see a, a big effort in our instances to utilize all the media channels, all the in-person opportunities to continue a very consistent message, which is that you know, this, is what, this is what the system is. You have your own thoughts, and those thoughts need to be put forward to make this system work in your interest. In your organization, you talk about transparency and accountability, um, words that are sometimes um, like kryptonite to politicians. Um, how do you, and how do you continue to push that message when there is evidence always, and I say this across the political lines, of a lack of transparency and the inability to embrace accountability? How do you continue to push that when many of our leaders, and don't get me wrong, I say leaders, I mean all leaders, um, are, are dodging it at, at right. every turn? I think the reality is... Um we, we don't necessarily have a system that lends itself to that. Welcome to the and, <laughs> and we, for, for many, many historical, cultural, and religious reasons, we have a culture wherein we would prefer to trust in the person as opposed to put them in a position where they can be successful. And so I think when we take the, as Matt would have mentioned earlier, we're not a watchdog organization, so we're not in the business of putting the flashlight on the individual who did the wrong thing. But if that individual was put into an environment where it was less likely to, right. to be involved in something like that, um, then you wouldn't have to re even rely on us to, to do that sort of thing. So I think it is an uncomfortable conversation for, for many reasons um, and for, for many people uh, because it makes you feel like you've done something wrong in some instances even when you haven't. Um, but the reality is, I think if we divert the attention away from the individual, we're not trying to probe into your life or your personal ethics or decision making, um, but here's a system that you can operate in that will protect you as a leader or a politician or in whatever function you have, and build trust among your constituents who are required for you to be successful. So for me, where I, the, the challenge that I see whenever you talk, talk about transparency and accountability it becomes very personal and very partisan and political. Right. It's, you know, well, don't look at me, look at what they did right. or look at what they do. And, and so you can't even get beyond the initial sort of introduction to the conversation because there is the, you know, the as people call it, describe it as tribalism um, of, of politics and the blame game that we play whenever, don't look at me, but you want to talk about what they did or, right. and, and so, we can't even, in many instances, get to the point that you talk, of, talk about where we create that space as right. opposed to putting our trust in, in the person. Well, and I think, I think you know, the, the fallacy of that argument, they did it, so if they're not doing it, so why do we have to do it? Mm -hmm. Those types of things, or look, who, look what they did versus what I did, um, doesn't bring us anywhere. And, and so um, what we've, we've looked to try and do is, is promote the concepts of transparency and accountability in very livable and functional ways. 
understanding what those are valued, uh, what those values bring forward, the opportunities, the, the confidence for that small business fo- person in a family island to make an investment and maybe expand their businesses because they believe that they have a great idea and a great solution and the mechanisms are built on merit, not necessarily based on affiliation. That's exactly what we need in our local economies. COVID shows us we need more diverse and substantial local economic drivers. That's what it requires. So when we, when we hear those types of discussions, which happen inevitably in the political space, it also reinforces our understanding that the need to get the voices of citizens, the private sector, and civil society more magnified in a, in a more robust space is, is critical because those, those voices are the ones that should be driving a need and a requirement for transparency, for a need and requirement for accountability, not just from a moral standpoint, but because that's what makes the system work in your own interest. You said something here that stuck out to me, getting the magnified voices. For me, often we keep hearing the same voices over and over, screaming um, above everyone else, saying the same things over and over. And as you said, we're, we're not moving the needle. I want to move the discussion um, to bring some focus to your advocacy, advocacy for ombudsman legislation mm-hmm. and as well as freedom of information mm-hmm. um, implementation. I almost want to sigh and say, here we go again. Um, (laughs) We have had the discussion, or we've raised this issue for the freedom of information and an ombudsman for so long. And every time time it seems we're always at the same Mm. starting point. But first of all, let's again talk about why these things are so important Mm -hmm. to the society. When you talk about even you know, uh, transparency and accountability and why these these particular things are so important in, in our society? Well, one of the things that I would highlight first, um, particularly in the instance of, of an ombudsman, for example, which, which in essence is a space where if there is malpractice in, in the public service, the citizens have a space where they can go to report that and to have uh, matters investigated. Not your MP office. No, right? In, in a, in a safe yeah. uh, and productive space, uh, in a standard way. It's one of those things that could easily uh, move you in that space of discomfort where it feels, you know, you're attacking the leaders or the politicians. But in reality, one of the standards or principles of good governance that we promote is responsiveness. Mm-hmm. And each of these uh, principles have indicators. So it's not guesswork in, in any sense of the word. These are vetted global standards that are backed by the UN and the World Bank and other multilateral organizations. But one of the indicators of a responsive system of governance is the ability to put things right when they have gone wrong systematically. And one of the key things that I think the Office of the Ombudsman be able to do or should be able to do in its most effective implementation is to give folks the space and and even the knowledge that when I carry out these businesses uh, with public spaces uh, and with with leaders at certain levels and and, in many, many different spaces, there's somewhere I can go if something goes wrong, if I think that there was malpractice or maladministration, uh, and and it eliminates a lot of that, that space for fair of standing up for the right thing and, mm-hmm. and when these things are brought forward, the reality is we're creating a landscape where future instances of it would be less likely. Um, and I think that when we standardize processes like that, we build confidence in the system, we build trust in the mm-hmm. system, and as we build confidence and trust, we build participation. There's a quote that we use in our community outreach that says that the strength of any country's democracy is directly related to the level of empowerment and engagement of its citizens. And so bills, well, laws like the Ombudsman Act and the Freedom of Information Act create a space where people can be more safely empowered. And like I always, always echo, which I think is really, really important on the backdrop of all of it, it safeguards the leaders. Mm -hmm. It gives them a formal space as well so that, you know, we don't run with misinformation about what someone did or didn't do because there are formalities for, for matters to be investigated. So I, I'm going to deal specifically with the ombudsman now, the ombudsman at this point. Having that office is one thing. Mm-hmm. Having the legislation is one thing. Yes. Will realistically a government empower that office to do the work? Because like so many other things that we talk about, 
having the legislation is great. Having it on the books, passing it in Parliament, giving great speeches is wonderful. But realistically, is a government really going to empower that office or that individual to do what is necessary to, as you put it, be responsive um, to ensure that similar acts don't happen in the future because you have you have now put that spotlight, mm -hmm. that flashlight, um, that hot light <laughs> on these, you know, a lot of these issues that, that, that we face as a country and as individuals, businesses, right. just trying to exist. So I, I think I think the end, the end goal is, is potentially yes, we, and we see the factors that would lead to something like that. Um, when you when you have a law like this, um, when we've seen it already in, in the instance of the information uh, commissioner, who's, who's, who has been an instance of progress in, in terms of the development of freedom of information, um, there is the capacity. However, the concept that will government empower is probably the wrong way to think about it. Will the citizens require? Mm. That's, that's part of what, what we need to do. We, we've done a lot of work in our organization with other civic organizations pushing, driving for freedom of information, pushing for ombudsman, because it's crucially necessary to make sure that the interests of citizens, when they feel like they've been deviated from, can be addressed, can be brought forward. Um, but freedom of information brings other opportunities. It, it brings the opportunities for us to better understand our environmental issues, for us to make sure that when new developments are coming into our communities, that, they, that all the factors that need to be looked at have been looked at, that decisions around how things have been given away or, or presented in terms of crown land are, are fair and equitable. Those things are crucial for people to feel like, yeah, I, I, I do see myself in this system. And that leads to better compliance. That leads to better participation. So, so what we've been doing in, in our most recent advocacy is really saying, look to places where you can anticipate if this is gonna happen. So the upcoming budget is a really important gauge. Last year, we saw only $150,000, which sounds like a lot to some folks, but the truth is that's not enough for what freedom of information required to come to fruition. So we were not fully surprised when it didn't happen as it was stated. Um, but we're now having another time to, for budgets to be developed. So folks can be talking to their MPs and say, we really want this to be prioritized. We really want to make sure that it has sufficient funding because we need this to make sure that we can feel comfortable about the decisions that are making, uh, the spending that's happening, the process of governance, and then we can play our role. Gentlemen, we're going to take a quick break. I do want to talk more about the Freedom of Information Act and even the hesitancy around it and mm -hmm. what people perceive could happen yeah. with, this, with this piece of legislation. So stay with us. We're going to take a break. We'll also examine how public education is playing a crucial role in ensuring an informed citizenry. Stay with us. We'll be back with more on the record right after. And welcome back. Uh, gentlemen, we are into our final segment of the show, but you mentioned the goal of org and its mission, and you recently released a report on civil society organizations. Can you share some of the important things that you found and explain why they matter for the Bahamas? So we have a, a strong belief that civil society organizations are crucial, and, and in national development, in ensuring vulnerable voices are heard, in, in providing direct services and preserving culture and all of these things. And in doing so, as we started our mission eight years ago, we realized we needed, a, we needed partners out there. And so we started to learn and talk to who was out there and working through that. And as we did, we realized there's a tremendous amount of folks who are dedicated to try and make a difference in different ways. Before COVID and Dorian, there was a, a different legislative model for these organizations. But at that point, we did a bit of, a, of an assessment and we found maybe there were like 1,100 of these groups that were out. Wow. After COVID, and we had then the passage of the not-for-profit law in 2019, um, it was required that all these organizations had to re-register. And when we did so, looking at who was there after the fact, we found uh, uh, some of the same folks, but a lot of new groups that were there. And in our belief is that if they're going to make a difference the way that we know that potentially they can, we want to understand who they are first and foremost, what elements that they see as their strengths, but their challenges, 
Uh, also, what's the impact on the folks that they're working with? And so we took a, we took a, a study uh, that we did with Sanagest International, who's done a number of things in the Bahamas before, and what it ultimately came out to show is one, there's a lot of not-for-profits out there. There might be as much as 1,200 registered not-for-profits right now in the Bahamas, across the islands. Um, oh. But we also realized that they're super under-resourced, most are, are dealing with budgets that, that may even be below $25,000. Mm -hmm. um, we saw a lot of them are gonna be driven by volunteers, they're passion projects, and they're not necessarily geared up for sustainability. So a not-for-profit organization, although it has a, a very positive mission, has to be as functional as a regular business. Mm -hmm. They have to be well organized. They have to make sure that they manage their funds. If they're going to exist. They're gonna, yeah. they're, in order to do the good work that's necessary, you need to be able to exist. So the study showed that, that one, uh, there were these common trends. But it also showed, which I thought was really important, the impact that they're having on their communities. So when looking at the beneficiaries of the organizations that were, that were surveyed, we found that more more than 60% believed that their lives had been significantly improved. Um, more than 60% saw that they, they, were, they, 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 saw, they were very satisfied with the work that had been done and their interactions with the organization. So what that tells you, and the most important thing about this report, is that we have such potential in this sector. So much can be done. A lot is being done with a very little right now. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of volunteers, there's a lot of dedicated folks who are, who are addressing issues in their community. But they're also not doing so in a way that is coordinated. So we need to learn more about ourselves. We need to work on how we collaborate and establish partnerships. Uh, the amount of organizations that we have is not uh, reflective of the amount of new funding sources that are out there. So there's also a value in working together to drive the kinds of impact. We have great programs that are happening in one island that literally have the answer that could, if we, if we drew, drove it to another island, could be replicated. So there's a lot of transfer of knowledge, there's a lot of shared uh, uh, experience that we think can be tapped into by working with these groups. Last year, we did a study, uh, not a study, we did a, a capacity building training that ran over eight months, and through that process, 109 not-for-profit leaders got training in fundraising and communications and project management and monitoring evaluation and financial uh, management and advocacy and communications. But it also talked a lot about the importance of collaboration. Mm. And we know in the issues that we're facing with issues like disaster, preparedness, recovery, recovery and relief, uh, we know that issues related to climate change adaptation, they're going to require groups, not just government, but groups outside of government working collaboratively, effectively, and being prepared to deal with the issues that are coming forward. I, I'm, I'm really um, happy to hear that we have so many organizations that are you know, committed um, to helping, because a lot of times um, it seems as if the same few organizations are always there trying to help well, or trying to first of all raise the alarm, draw attention, and then trying to help. But 1,200 is pretty significant. Well, that tells you that there's a lot of folks that you may not know of that yeah. are putting their heads down to just do the need, do the work that's needed but in the community. It really is coordination. Yeah. Um, in, in in many respects. Prior to the break, I know. Sorry, you were going to say something. Well, I was just going to say I think uh, the good thing about the the new NPO Act and and the organization of the sector at large. It does allow us to take some steps toward making sure that all of the organizations that so the are legislation out there working, does work. Yeah. It, it's, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a <working>. start. <laughs> it needs it needs work, and we are right. we are putting forward uh, with our civil society partners uh, consistently recommendations on how to better organize. But I think two key things are happening. Matt mentioned the cluster training, um, which allows us to group nonprofits by cause, so that there can be not only collaboration and partnership on projects, but really importantly, sharing of those limited resources. Mm -hmm. And sharing of information, too, I would right. think. And the yeah. information is really, really important because you know, we have, we've gotten complaints from the community, because we are promoting responsibility in civil society as well, that you know, after Dorian, for example, 10 organizations are coming and asking the community the same question. So everyone's doing a survey as opposed to one central group or one coordinated yeah, effort I guess kind with, of with, with yeah. shared information. Um, so I think that we have a great opportunity to, to do that. And with the mapping of the sector, which is one of the things that we're intending to do, 
Uh, that should help to make the process a little bit easier so folks can understand that this is a really large, widespread. And, and it's also effort. important to understand that as, as we talk about it, this is being done by lots of groups at different times. Right. So our, we have partners uh, like Wana Luthra that are doing work mm -hmm. in this space, uh, even Hands for Hunger, Civil Society Bahamas, uh, you know, different parts of folks in UB, or they're all thinking about how do we build this sector because when it's in place, it serves a really strong, important right. part in terms of national development and preserving democracy. So one final question on this before we get back to something mm -hmm. that we started talking about, but just as you look at, or you all are, are focused um, on responsible governance um, and trying to keep those folks who lead us accountable and transparent, what about these organizations? Because mm -hmm. let's be honest, you know, every, Every mission is not about helping. Mm -hmm. um, and so who are the watchdogs or, or who, are the, who is going to be responsible for ensuring that these organizations are doing what they say right. that they are supposed to do? So, so I'm sorry, jumping in. Having worked in the not-for-profit sector for my entire career, so 30-some plus years, um, what you see is one bad apple is the narrative that people run with. Of the course. reality is that most organizations actually are and started with a very positive intention. So building in standards to reinsure and support that, the truth is the focus is not let's, let's, let's minimize the potential for this one bad apple to happen, but it's more how do we magnify all the other good work that's happening out there. So, yeah. yeah, and I think that um, Similar to, to with government, the, the best proponents for monitoring any institution are the people. So when people better understand what a nonprofit is, how it's supposed to function, how do we evaluate for, for the mission? How do you keep them accountable how, as well? Right. Yeah. So mm -hmm. with, with the standards that we promote, they are applicable across the board. So okay. we are, in our capacity building training, we're looking at models that allow nonprofit organizations, churches, and other civic groups uh, to be accountable, to be transparent, to make sure uh, that they are reporting in the relevant places. So it's another potential strength of the Nonprofit Act of 2019 that allows uh, folks to adhere to the standards that have been put in place. Now, not every standard is 100% applicable, but it does begin to chart a course that wanting to do good and wanting to help people is one thing, but you do assume certain risks when you decide, I want to start an organization sure. or mm -hmm. work for one or be a part of one, regardless if you are a nonprofit professional by training and you're paid to do it, or if you're a volunteer, which the majority of us that work in the space also volunteer and, and do lots of you know gratis work as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but realistically speaking, we are in the communities, we are in people's spaces, and, and that creates a certain level of risk and so making sure that standards are in place by which we can ourselves be accountable, transparent, responsive, um, consensus oriented, and all of the other principles of good governance is, is equally as paramount. I would say there's also one takeaway we want folks at home to, to, to get is before you decide you're going to start your own organization, <laughs> take one. a minute, <laughs> check out, yeah, see there, say, yeah, get, get involved. involved with yes. one first, see yes. how, it, how it operates, and, and you never know the thing that you're looking to do, someone else is probably right. already doing out right. there. So how do you even partner with them? I want to get back, though, to uh, a discussion we had prior to going into the break and the challenges that we continue to face with the implementation of the Freedom of Information. Mm -hmm. And why is it that, you know, this continues to be, I call it a non-starter. We have great mm -hmm. discussions, there's a lot said, and then nothing. Well, I, to apply context to this, and, and we were in that same space. As soon as the bill was passed, like let's, it's it's good to go. When we started to talk to folks in other countries where they had had this implemented, you saw that there was a pace of implementation that was like three to five years. So we're now on seven years. So clearly we're beyond that, but we're not outside of the range of what happens in the Caribbean. And there's other countries that are, have passed their bills earlier and passed their laws earlier and still aren't in in compliance, others that are now starting to retrench on, on things that they've had. So it's a, it's a, it's a, a challenging law, I think, for governments, uh, particularly small governments, to really figure out how do we utilize this and, and or how do we implement this. And then on the, on the citizen side, I think there also has to be similar work in terms of understanding how do you utilize this law. So as we've, we've seen the steps so far, um, 
we've seen a few pieces of the law being enacted. There's a whistleblower's component that was enacted that is not fully described as to how you utilize it, but it's there. And then the other part, which is the most important, is the passage of, is the enactment of the uh, hiring of an information commissioner and infor an information commissioner's team, and that's been done as well. And we've worked pretty closely with that team, and we do understand there's a lot that has been done. There's a lot of internal work. They have plans, they've worked with consultants, they've organized a pathway that brings forward the public test, the public interest test, which is what is to be used when information is brought forward and deemed as, as it should be shared, but government is saying no. Um, there's uh, regulations that translate how the process will go, where that is, and they've even identified the type of technology that's necessary. And there's been some training, as we understand, preliminary training of the, of the, of the, the teams within each ministry that's been identified. All of those things are critical because they're necessary steps on the pathway. But without the sufficient funding, it's not realistic to understand that this would move forward. So in this year's budget, last was the last year's budget, it was only $150,000, and that wouldn't be sufficient to do the kind of internal training with government, the external training of citizenry, uh, the, the technology development. All of those require, I think the estimated budget might have been about a million dollars, is what we were thinking. So now, again, we're on a point of we've seen movement, we've seen preparation, they're ready, they're, they're more than ever before prepared to be able to move something forward that would bring a right to, to the Bahamians that was legally there since 2017 into, into action. But it needs funding. So again, we, we think that the, the greatest and, and most uh, posititive way to move forward on this is for citizens to talk to the folks that they've elected and say, you we need this to be prioritized. You just read my mind, because to me it now comes down to phoning up your MP, sending an email, find them on social media. Don't go to the house and harass them. <laughs> Let me just take that out of the <laughs> But reach out to your MP and say, listen, we need for... You know, it's on the books. We need better funding. Right. We need full implementation and action because these, and let's be honest, these are campaign promises right. that we have heard for the last three elections, probably even four. Three that I remember. Right. We're going to institute the Freedom of Information Act. We're going to... Right. And, and we don't and want these to be those empty campaign promises. Yes. No. And, and for, for a bit of context for someone that may be interested in reaching out to um, an elected official, one of the things that I've learned is even with the establishment of the office of the commissioner, that's the oversight, right? So the, the current structure allows for information officers to actually be stationed at different ministries and departments. Those are going to be the folks who will be able to identify where there are gaps in digitization. So if a file that we need access to is lost 20 years under a desk somewhere, mm -hmm. um, we will be able to evaluate the state of what the, this department or ministry is in to even be able to provide information. But that definitely cannot happen. So it's not just asking for money for money's sake. Sure. This equips, trains, empowers, and hires the people that will make this thing actually work. Because if it was coordinated from one central office in a building somewhere else, you would understand that there would automatically be probably a pretty large backlog and the level of responsiveness once again would be low. Um, so the system itself is, is encouraging, it has a lot of promise, but the funding would go toward making sure that at that individual level, at the points you need information, you make the best decisions for yourself, for your family, as a Bahamian citizen when you have the information that you need to make those decisions. So we're talking about not just people's future, but people's present. Mm -hmm. But the only way that we're going to see that happen is if people are empowered to reach out. And the only way that they're going to be empowered is if they are informed. Um, I think one of the things that people expected is with the freedom of information to be able to walk in and say, hey, Give me a copy of that contract no. <laughs> well, and, that you gave to Mark. And, and, the, and the truth is, though, if you read the, the laws is written very well, and, and it, there's, there are areas for exemption, mm -hmm. but they're, they're not the majority. There's a lot of information. You might get something that might be redacted because of something, sure. but, mm -hmm. but you have to, you'll have to be able to present what you want in the space. Like if you go to Ministry of Education and say, give me the permits for blah, 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 that's not the right space. You have to go to the part of government that would contain those records, and within that space you would ask, and they have 30 days to respond, and if they deny, then you have the ability to appeal within that agency. And if they still deny, then you can go to the information commissioner. And if 
and from that point you can take it even to a legal means. So there's a pathway for, for recourse. And again, but, it but comes down to education. It yeah. does, and I think what we also want folks to understand related to freedom of information is the, the benefit may not be necessarily that you see why you might go and get that information, but when you have an active and an engaged Freedom of Information Act in a country, research shows that you get more effective and more efficient government uh, decision making and spending. You get more trust in the system. You get greater compliance by citizens who are paying their taxes when they're supposed to and going the right way and not paying tip money on the sides. The benefit of having a mechanism that if we need to get information, it can be available, makes everybody think a bit before they just arbitrarily do something that may be not going to shine well in, in the light of day. Again, coming back to responsible governance. Right. Gentlemen, we are out of time, unfortunately. Matt, I'm going to give you just any few closing remarks you want to leave us with us. No, I, I, our, our mechanisms are pretty simple, so I'll just reiterate. We want folks to get informed and get involved. We are committed to working and playing our role to help to facilitate all the sectors to work together. There's too much, too much riding on this for us not to, to press forward on it and, and bring us together towards a positive solution. And you guys are in the digital spaces if people want to get more information all and get involved. All social media platforms at Org Bahamas Foundation and for any citizen, school, group, institution that is interested in us presenting or giving information to empower your community, you can reach us at citizens at orgbahamas.com. All right, good stuff. Gentlemen, thank you very much for being with us thank tonight. You. We really appreciate it. This conversation doesn't end here. It's a call to action for each of us to recognize our role in governing our communities. Principles of transparency, accountability, and inclusivity that org champions are universal. They remind us that good governance is not a distant ideal, but a tangible goal achievable through the collective effort of informed and engaged citizens. So let's, t let's take the inspiration from org. Again, a special thank you to our guests and audience. We'll see you on the next episode of On the Record.